Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Richard Kestenbaum, who's the co founder of a private investment banking group called Triangle Capital. He's an expert at consumer products, apparel, retail, digital markets, and he's also a really good Forbes contributor and co-author of three books on finance and tech, and um, really good at uh, M&A and other topics, of course. Richard, it's good to see you. I'd like to just jump right into uh, something you said recently that uh, we're kind of entering the golden age of content. And on the heels of that, you wrote a, a really insightful Forbes article, I thought, that coincidentally kind of complements the article I just wrote about the future of uh, creators and influencers. So maybe we can talk about that too. But more importantly, let's jump into yours. Um, so Amazon is buying MGM, we're told. And uh, what I'm hearing is it's not just about Amazon Studios or Prime. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, pick up a massive studio. But really, it's more about the future of retail. What What's going on there? Well, first of all, Thank you so much, Dean. It's great to be here, and I'm honored to be with you today. Oh, my um, pleasure. My, my article of this morning on Forbes.com and your article of May 20th on Forbes.com are about two different things, but I think they're really about the same thing. And what they're about is the way in which retail and consumer has changed and is now very driven by influencers, and more importantly, by content. What we used to find is that consumers are, associate, consumers are attracted to products and services that create status for them, that display their status. That is over. And what consumers want now is products that associate with their personal values. What are some of those things? Sustainability the way that products relate to the earth, the way that management treats people, the length of the supply chain, whether everyone in the supply chain gets a fair wage, things that are universal values. Yeah, and even uh, even diversity and inclusion has popped up on that diversity list. Diversity and inclusion, absolutely right. And many more, uh, many other things, but diversity and inclusion, especially since the last year, uh, has become critically important. Mm -hmm. And when you see a product in a store or on a website, on a web page, you can't tell what it is. And so brands use social media and other means to communicate their values. And when they do that effectively, it turbocharges their marketing because consumers want to be associated with their products and their brands. They are willing to pay full price and they turbocharge the company's marketing by telling their friends on social media and otherwise. And that leads to very high profitability for companies that can do all that effectively. That is a huge challenge for legacy companies because their content about values is very often viewed as inauthentic because it was so clearly bolted on as another <laughs> marketing or advertising campaign. Exactly. By the PR group, right? Yeah. Right. And these kinds of values are not like an advertising campaign that changes from year to year or season to season. They're permanent. And if they're not perceived as permanent, they're perceived as fake. And consumers don't want that. Mm. And that's why direct to consumer brands who use social media for their promotion have been effective in, even though they have far fewer resources than the legacy brands and retailers, chipping away at those larger, older companies and taking market share from them. And legacy companies that can't adapt and develop these new skills and presentation are being hurt, and that won't change. So why is um, Amazon making such a big move? MGM is, uh, it's, it's a big fish. Yeah. and. It's one of the only big studios left. It's a $9 billion transaction. Why would Amazon do that? There's the short and obvious reason and the longer term and less apparent reason. The first, the short and obvious reason is they need content for Prime Video. 
But what is Prime Video? Prime Video is, yes, it's a way of keeping your subscribers and they make money from that. But Prime Video is a tool through which they give their subscribers additional value using the content that they have and that keeps them associated with the Amazon brand. Why is that important? Because we're going to see a change in how, in how social media works. Right now, when you look at social media, the people who make money are Facebook and Instagram and whatever other social media you're using. In the future, that'll be different. The revenue that now goes to Facebook and Instagram is going to go to the people who motivate the eyeballs, either the content creators or the referrers, the influencers, or even the consumers themselves when they consume content. And we've seen this in other forms. The movie studios used to have stars on contract, right. and then the stars revolted, and they said, no, we want the value. We've seen it in sports. The, the owners used to make all the money, and the players revolted. Well, the same thing's happening in social media. The content creators are revolting. And eventually, we're going to see the compensation move away from the social media companies and into the hands of the creators of the content and those people who drive the eyeballs. And that means that retailers and brands that can create great, great content will receive value for it. And if the content is good enough, it's going to become a second stream of revenue. The opportunity for them is not just to show old reruns of shows, which is what Prime Video is today, and, and new movies, of course, and new content, not just to show content that doesn't relate to the products that they're selling, but to include the products they're selling in a way that, that the content relates to. And that is the big challenge. And the, the companies that can do that will create association and identity have high profit margins and have relatively low marketing costs because people will come for the content. Yeah, this is where the crossover between our articles is is fascinating. Um, let's hold that thought for a second, though. The creators and the uh, the influencers and and the the power shift. But let's back up a little bit more tactically. So I can see how Amazon can pull this off. They are algorithmically um, ninja type people that really know how to uh, leverage an asset like that. But then I look at others like uh, Walgreens, Walmart, Target have their own little video networks, but now those are graduating to bigger networks, but they're kind of like in-store ad plays. You know, how do these companies really transform into content-based creators and take more control from, you know, let's just call it the digital platforms and social media companies that they're paying advertising to? How do they actually become a big deal? I don't and think, compete against Amazon now, who's going to be, think, again, a lo much larger advantage. I don't think Walgreens and Walmart are going to be the ones that will challenge Amazon on content. Walgreens has a lot of issues, particularly the core of the store, the non-pharmacy part of the business where all the square feet are is challenging sure. for them. But let's talk about Walmart. Amazon is using this content as we just discussed. But Walmart is selling based on price and the price value relationship and assortment and convenience. And those things don't require content. What requires content is higher price product, product that has a high gross margin uh -huh. and product that has marketing content. That's not typically what Walmart sells. Walmart has a lot of advantages in scale, and logistics, technology, assortment, and above all, price. All the other things drive to price. Um, and, and price will always be important. And content will eventually be important for Walmart, but not until later because they have that scale and price advantage that they're competing against. Right. I think we're seeing some really interesting brands Brands that are being created now using content. How does that happen? You look at a beauty business, <clears throat> excuse me, like Glossier. Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? It's a huge and very successful and valuable company. It came from a blog. First, there was no product. 
and there was only a blog called Into the Gloss. And beauty customers, primarily women, learned about beauty ideas, beauty secrets, beauty tips from Into the Gloss. After the audience was curated, products were created on Glossier. And there was no marketing cost because the audience was already there. And the audience already believed in the credibility of the vendor because of the blog, the content that related to the product. We're seeing other people create other things, smaller now, but it's going to grow. There's a company I think, called, I think you mentioned one innovation, um, what's it called? Yeah, there's a company called Innovation Department. And what they do is before they create any product, they create and they curate content. Mm -hmm. And they pick a particular subject, wellness, pets, various CBD, various things. And they create blogs and emails and they get an audience to follow them. Once they have the audience, they know what the audience is interested in and they create products that are sold primarily on Amazon, but also on other places. And they drive their audience to those products. The products have to be good. Regardless of how you do it, you can never sell something that's second best and get a full price for it. But the question is, how do you drive your audience in such a noisy world as the one we live in? Without going and paying all the social media companies, like you said, it's like, well, you have to democratize that and take control of it if you're gonna be a real content company, or at in least build your own audience at some point. Investors right. have seen too many companies that have raised incredible amounts of money, drop it into marketing, and have it be unsustainable. Might as well go fund Facebook. Just give them the money. That's right. <laughs> and now the, fo now the focus is on profits. How short is your timeline to profitability and how credible is it? Right. Facebook and Instagram have gotten really smart about understanding where the profit is, how much it is, and how much or how much of that they can grab by charging more for access to their consumers. Exactly. So you mentioned content brands, uh, two small ones. Is that really a sustainable path? I mean, that usually is like really cool at the beginning. It's like, hey, these different you know brands come out of nowhere. They do social, they do blogs, they do video. Um, but is that really going to fund and, and drive hundreds of brands in the future? Or is it just like the first one in a category? No, I think it's not just sustainable, I think it's the most sustainable because mm -hmm. it comes at a relatively low cost. And so cre continuing to create new content is much less expensive than promoting on Facebook, Instagram, and other social media. And that makes it very attractive for brands to invest in it. In addition- Yeah, yeah as, I meant from a consumer point of view though, are they always gonna be attracted to that? Well, it it's a little bit of work, really. Then it's, I just want to buy something. I don't need to do all this research and watch. <laughs> okay, so a couple of things there. Just give me the other side of the coin, sorry. It depends on the quality of the content. And as we see brands or other creators being rewarded for their content, there's going to be more and more incentive to create better content. And that's why we're in a golden age of content. But there will never be a substitute for the products being sold based on price. There will always be a market and there will always be a consumer who wants to shop on price. And the low cost producer has an advantage in that market and everyone else will get squeezed. And that will never change. But we're not, we're, what we're describing is a, a different consumer or a consumer who's shopping for something else that's more important to them that reflects their values. Yeah, that's a good point. The um, when I look at the uh, let's just shift a little bit over to the um, kind of creators influencers in my article on Forbes, I basically teed up an unlikely candidate, Amway, as kind of taking a lead there because they've got a million entrepreneurs out there that are, you know, essentially resellers, but many of them are getting empowered and doing exactly what you just said, and yes. it it gives them a leg up, you know, in a, in a niche sort of way. But um, is that how you see the the big companies taking this over this business model as you as it is sorry dean you froze for a moment um sorry but, about that yeah just how do you feel about big brands actually capitalizing on this 
Well, that's their challenge. If you're yeah. a brand selling toothpaste or breakfast cereal in supermarkets, how do you adapt into the direct-to-consumer world? Very, very challenging. And a few things are going to happen there. Some brands will be able to adapt, but many brands will get usurped. They will either acquire other brands that are successful in the direct-to-consumer and influencer market, or they will create their own and be successful that way. And Unilever has done that many times. That's right. Example. One of the, you say to yourself, why do they pay so much? They pay so much because when they calculate what they can learn in their other businesses from these direct to consumer businesses that they acquire that are relatively small, it's worth a lot to them. That will only happen for a while. After they buy a few and they realize, well, it's either not transferable or we've learned everything we can, right. values will come more down to earth. And we see that happen very often with financial assets. When there's a new form of doing business, values explode because people think there's no top to this. And then they realize, no, there are some real metrics here and we have to have discipline and there are going to be winners and losers. Not everyone's a winner and we can't pay the moon for everything. Right. And a lot of the comps and uh, comparables have been thrown out the window. So Schmidt's Natural is a great example of that. Unilever buying them and, and, and a few others. So what are you seeing in the M&A space? I mean, I'm, I'm on a, uh, a board of a uh, private equity group. We invest in you know food companies, the next generation of food. So what I'm seeing in food and beverages and health, beauty and wellness, um, skin care and stuff is almost, almost tech style valuations right now, to your point. Um, it's you know, the desire, the demand is there so much. It seems like these big brands continue to uh, gobble them up. But just on the core funding, they're getting funding right now at pretty high multiples. So, uh, yeah, give us your take on what's going on in M&A and uh, funding these next-gen companies. I've been shocked at many of the valuations that we've been able to get for these direct-to-consumer companies that get it right. Yep. Let's talk about what get it right means high gross margin, low marketing cost, and high growth. If you have those three things, your company is worth multiples of revenue that were previously unheard of. W what are those trends? You've hit on some really interesting sectors, food and beverage, wellness and beauty. I think that in a lot of ways, the food and beverage that's exploding and the beauty component that's exploding are part mm -hmm. of wellness. Because of the explosion in anxiety, and especially, like so many things, accelerated by the pandemic, wellness is a very big topic that includes much of food, a lot of beauty, some travel, some fashion like athleisure, all of which give consumers a sense of well-being that everyone feels the need for more than ever before. And those businesses have exploded. That won't stop when the pandemic is fully gone because the trend toward increasing anxiety was with us long before the pandemic. And there are underlying, <clears throat> excuse me, societal reasons for that, that were only turbocharged by the pandemic. Right. So anything that's legitimately associated with wellness is likely to continue to have great value. And if you can convince a consumer to pay full price without spending a ton on marketing, you're going to have high margins and those companies are worth a crazy ton of money. Yeah. Let's talk about some, um, so, you know, brands, retailers, uh, digital service providers, like we've talked about, uh, the whole personalization of shopping and helping consumers find things. Um, you know, Revive, the sponsor of this program, and, you know, full disclosure, I'm chairman there. You know, the health, beauty, and wellness technology where you can just take out your phone, take a selfie of your your, your face, uh, hit a couple preferences, and quickly kind of do a diagnostic check on you. And rather than looking at 20 products, it narrows it down to two or three. So retailers and brands love that, especially if they have a lot of SKUs, that personalization and that relationship development with consumers. And what, what are your thoughts in that category? Personalization is very important in the consumer industry. <clears throat> what we're seeing in beauty particularly is that personalization is not just at the level of helping you choose the right product. 
It's at the level of creating the right product. We're seeing companies now that have the operations and production technology to customize their formulations for individual consumers and to use technology to understand which formulation is right for each consumer right. and to enable them to buy the thing that's right for them immediately without having to try 20 things that fail. And that's going to be more important as time goes on. So yes, personalization is important. It always was. But now there's technology that can help do personalization on a mass basis. And yeah, I, guess there's, uh, I guess there's two levels. You, know, you just hit on one, which is actually formulaic, personalizing the product that you're getting. Yours is going to be different than mine, not by SKU count, but by actual product. And we've had a couple of those on the program and, and a couple of large brands who they, large brands have a really hard time scaling that. So that's still something to be solved. And and then there's personalization of just helping mass market brands, you know, help their consumers kind of figure out what, what should, you know, what should they buy from the normal SKU products? Um, are you, uh, are you seeing any investments in the product personalizations that you just talked about? We are, are customizing at the formula level. We are, we're seeing a lot of it. Some of it is more important than others. With some of it, it's helping to create or to identify a formula to treat skin, for example, that's mm -hmm. one out of 12 different choices using technology to do that. But some of it is picking a formula out of millions of possible formulations. So, and, and we're also seeing technology that helps, I, that, that combines with other science. For example, helping you choose the right bottle of wine without trying it. And that's done by combining the AI technology of individual taste with the chemistry knowledge of what's in the wine and what flavors come out. We'll see that with other olfactory things like fragrance and beer and liquor and coffee and other things that are judged by what your what your nose does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we call that preference data. And uh, we like to use, you know, deep skin analysis where the AI is actually working in the background telling you what you need and then maybe overlaying some preferences, you know, pricing and what just different kind of styles you like. And uh, it's a fascinating uh, convergence going on there. The technology is finally caught up where it is something that is not a burden for consumers, but actually finally helping them. Whereas most apps on your phone, they're just a nuisance. It's like, give me something that'll help me save me time and uh, get me to stop buying so many different things. So the trying part, you're right. Even though the wine part, I don't know, I kind of like trying various different kinds of <laughs> well, <laughs> trial and error. No, open another one. <laughs> could try fewer and try more things that you're going to really like. You have a better experience doing it. And you exactly. know, we exactly. all I was just egging you on there. We all remember things we've bought where we bought something we didn't expect and it turned out to be great, a wine, something you wear, anything like that, even a car. And and that's a great experience that we want to repeat more of and do more of. And that's what AI technology can help us do. Yeah, absolutely. So we kind of started talking about Amazon and drifted away. You know, the um, can, is there anyone that can compete with Amazon, the, the gorilla that it is at this point? I guess let's just take retail because they're in too many businesses to, to take on the global question. But um I, we get asked this a lot it's like uh, well we're just going to go to amazon and sell everything and um so for instance walmart kroger others are, have started their own marketplace almost like a me too thing at least they've started marketplaces and they're working with entrepreneurs and vendors um yeah what, what do you uh, you see anybody that can really stand up and uh, compete with those guys like amazon. most people most people don't say yeah, this is an they don't come to me for an investment and say well, we have an amazon killer never heard those words <laughs> amazon is great at selection and convenience, really convenience. Yes. It's just so easy and they make everything so easy for you. So if you're selling based on convenience, it's almost impossible to beat them. But you know, buying a Fruit of the Loom t-shirt where you know exactly what you want mm -hmm. and you go to Amazon and you put, enter it and you get it, 
couldn't be easier than that. But that is a different experience than buying an occasion dress from Oscar de la Renta. That's really hard for Amazon to do. They're trying, but it's not a huge business for them. Why is that? Because Amazon's set up for convenience and they're not set up for discovery of products that involve taste and fit and the experience of finding it and the pleasure of doing something new. That's not their business. So you might say to me, well, okay, but historically that's been done mostly in stores and that's why they're not successful. Well, yes and no. Netta Porte is very successful at that and they do a great job. And by the way, coming back to the other parts of this conversation, they do it with, in large measure with content. Not only because they have great descriptions, but because if you want to learn about fashion, you go to Net-A-Porte or Mr. Porter, that's the men's site, and they teach you how to wear things, what goes with what, what's the latest in whatever. And it's very engaging content if you're interested in the subject, and it causes you to identify new things that you wouldn't have thought of and to buy them. And those are great shopping experiences. And that's not what Amazon does. So how do you compete with Amazon? Well, you don't try to have a bigger sword than they have in the same sword fight. You pick a different fight. And if you can do that, you can win. Yeah, good, good words of wisdom there. Very similar to what I said about the Amway example in, in the uh, creator article. It's like, yeah, you can't go after the king of the jungle head on. You've got to kind of hit them at the knees or the legs or just where they're not. And they don't really have a creator community and influencer community. I'm sure they will so someday. But the whole content uh, angle, there is so much that these individual brands can do because they're not generalist. And Amazon's a generalist. So is Walmart. It's the specificity around whatever it is. You know, how, you mentioned high cost fashion, or luxury fashion, I should say, versus, you know, you know, $100 summer dresses. Like there are experts in that area or brands that only do that. So it's like define your terms and how you're going to compete. Would that be a better way to say it? Or de or defend yourself and, and, and you know, make sure you're picking the right ways to, to do that. Have a moat, I think. Have a, have a moat. We'll go with the armor, the knight in shining armor. <laughs> you have to have a moat. If you don't Richard, have an advantage. Yeah, it's exactly. So you talk to a lot of large companies who want to acquire you know, firms that you represent. You talk to a lot of younger startups, emerging growth companies that use you for funding. What kind of advice would you uh, give? Uh, let's just take on both of them, but let's start with the uh, startups, aspiring uh, entrepreneurs. Um, you know, maybe they got a little run rate, need to go for a series ABC. Um, any quick tips? Well, what we do is most of what we do, we raise capital as you're describing, we sell companies, we create liquidity events for shareholders and managers and founders and help them do a transaction that is typically the most important transaction they've ever done. And one of the things that I find myself saying very often is, you know, the process of selling your company is very distracting. It's a change of life for a lot of people. It's a the receipt of a huge amount of capital that people have generally never seen before in their lives. And one of the things I find myself saying often is, run your business while you're selling it as though you're never gonna sell it. Make decisions that are the decisions you would make if you, if you would be owning this business for the next 50 years. Because even though some of them may hurt you in the short term because you'll spend money on this thing or that or this investment, buyers are generally smart and they are gonna see how you've run the business and that it may hurt you in the short run, but it adds value when people see how your business has been run, the things that you've invested in that they're going to be helped by when they own it. And it's very easy to make short term decisions that benefit you immediately. It's harder to make long term decisions, but those are the best ways to mm -hmm. run a business. Good advice. Having been both a buyer and a seller, I, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, in 30 seconds or less, what about the big companies? We call them the BFSs, the big, fat, and slows. Any quick advice for them about shopping for emerging growth companies? Well, when you call them BFS, you know, one it, wonders. It's an honorable term. It's how, do, like, how, do you, how do you win? 
you know, <laughs> there, there is their challenges in their very name. So, you know, what are their, what I find is that for those companies to adapt, it has to come from the top, not near the top, but the very top. It can't be a small commitment. It has to be a big commitment. And when there's a big commitment for change, change can happen. And that change may include changing people, people that you like and people that have done a good job who are not as well suited to the way the world is becoming. And if you're willing to adapt to those changes and it comes from the top and everyone gets the message, you can be successful. But if any of those things are not present, it's not going to work. Perfect. Let's leave it there. Richard, thanks for joining us today. You've been listening to, <coughs> excuse me, Richard Kestenbaum, the co-founder of the Triangle Capital Group. This is Dean Tobias with the Reboot Chronicles. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you soon.